Germany is uh, uh, staying home uh, after the surgery in the back. Uh, so I'm in his place to issue the tender. Uh, so I just uh, visited Europe, Europe last week, and uh, uh, he seems to be in, in good spirit, uh, spirit, and also he's doing pretty well. So for anybody who is concerned. Uh, so uh, Xander uh, Wurz is a professor in Baylor College of, uh, of Medicine, and he is uh, um, currently uh, director of Cardiovascular Research Institute there, uh, a professor in uh, molecular physiology and medicine department. And Xander uh, got his MD and uh, PhD in uh, Maastricht University in Netherlands. 2001 and 2002, and he then went to Columbia University for four years as a postdoctoral research fellow, uh, working on uh, the uh, Rhino research. And then he had his own lab in Biller College of Medicine in 2005, and quickly raised the rank of professor uh, in 2011. Uh, and he has uh, made a lot of contributions in the understanding of the cardiac uh, physiology, molecular physiology, and also uh, diseases. And he has published more than 140 papers. Uh, and along the way, he has collected uh, some awards, including um, here uh, the, the Glaxo Swiss Klein uh, International Award for Clinical Research, just the name of the field. Not all of them, uh, and also uh, the uh, the CAC Foundation distinguished the uh, young scientist in medical research, and also uh, just recently he got the established uh, investigator award from the American Heart Association. Uh, he has been elected a fellow uh, for several uh, societies, including European Society of Cardiology, and uh, um, uh, the uh, fellow for uh, the Heart Racing Society and also the American Heart Association. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to hear his research. And his talk is named New Insights into Atrial Fibrillation Progression. Thank you. Well, it was great to be here, and I really enjoyed meeting uh, many of you earlier today already. And uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to let me present some of our work. Um, just before I talk about atrial fibrillation, just uh, one slide about uh, sort of the general approach we take. Uh, we're interested in both uh, inherited and adult onset disease, and you know, we're very interested in inherited disease because can directly link a mutation in, uh, in an infant or child to a disease and that really uh, you know, identifies genes and proteins that are of great interest to cardiac physiology and pathophysiology. Um, and a lot of those same genes that can cause inherited disease uh, and the same proteins are also affected in adults with uh, late onset disease. And of course, uh, you guys have an amazing program here, you know, in the explanted hearts to study uh, what happens in failing hearts, uh, etc. We've done uh, recent work on uh, on atrial biopsies, and we've learned a lot from this uh, too. Um, so we study uh, human genetics, human tissue samples, and uh, we often then subsequently uh, make mouse models of those observations to understand whether there's a causal link between. Um, a gene mutation or a protein modification or expression that change and see if these mice are more susceptible. And we, we then uh, use that for further development of therapeutic approaches, including uh, yeah, small molecules we're working on, as well as uh, uh, we're exploring uh, gene therapy as, as possibilities. So today, um, I'll focus on atrial fibrillation. We also work on cardiomyopathies and and heart failure in my lab. Uh, but I wanted to talk about atrial fibrillation uh, since it's uh, the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia that uh, one can see in, in clinical practice. It's a major cause of uh, 
increased mobility, for example, stroke volume, uh, stroke risk goes up uh, about six times in those patients with uh, persistent AF, and mortality risk is elevated. And clinically, AF can be characterized based on the duration of the disease. So um, early on in the disease uh, process, it's called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation because the episodes are self-terminating and uh, they don't last for more than a week. But over time, these patients often develop progression of disease uh, duration and intensity. And uh, in the case of persistent or chronic AF, uh, you can have long-standing episodes uh, that are more and more difficult to treat, and some of these patients eventually develop permanent AF that's uh, resistant to medical interventions and difficult to treat, and even if the ablation successes are incomplete. So a lot of the patients that have this paroxysmal AF then go on to develop uh, chronic AF in about 15% on an annual basis, so it's really a big problem. And uh, what we are hoping to do is to understand better what causes this progression and if we can maybe, uh, with pharm pharmacology, intervene early on as opposed to doing ablations uh, when it's too late. Um, there are several mechanisms that have been proposed to contribute to AF, and I think the big picture is that <clears throat> one needs uh, <clears throat> You need a trigger to set off the arrhythmia, so to start the first abnormal beat, but you also need a vulnerable substrate. Something has to be different electrically or structurally in the atria for this abnormal uh, ectopic activity to set up an arrhythmia. Now there's a lot of debate in the field, and I'm sure you've heard about it before here, that you know, atrial fibrillation can be, uh, be sustained by a single uh, uh, re-entrant circuit with a rotor or multiple circuits or could even be caused by uh, uh, a lot of ectopic activity in the pulmonary veins. Um, I guess there's probably heterogeneity in the patients and maybe some of or, or all of them contribute. Um, but uh, the end result is that when you have atrial fibrillation, there's electrical, structural remodeling, uh, remodeling of calcium handling within the atria uh, that makes it more likely for any subsequent trigger to set up a new arrhythmia for these arrhythmias to last longer. Um, so just talking about the arrhythmia initiation, so we've done some of this work uh, in the past couple of years. Um, the three major mechanisms that contribute to this atrophic activity, you have atrial automaticity, so you get uh, cells that behave like pacemakers, but they're not the SA node, they're elsewhere in the atria. You can have delayed after depolarization, so you can have additional action potentials that emerge immediately following uh, the previous action potential, but before uh, the sinus node is firing and activating the atrium. We can have early after the polarizations that can take off during repolarization and uh, then uh, re-excite this action potential. Now for delayed after the polarizations, and probably to some extent for the early after the polarizations too, calcium handling abnormalities are uh, very important. Um, since I'll be talking about calcium handling a lot, I'll just review the basics and sort of ex explain how you can get a DAD. So calcium, uh, <clears throat> well, excitation contraction uh, is started when the voltage-gated calcium channels that are actually not shown here are activated and a little bit of calcium emphasis cell and it activates the uh, reactive receptor calcium release channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's where all the calcium is stored in the cardiac myocytes. You get a much greater release of calcium uh, from these stores, and this uh, initiates contraction of the myofilaments and the cardiac myocytes. Now, whatever calcium is released from the reanidone receptor, the RAF2, will then be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum for the SRATPase of circa 2. And whatever calcium came in to the cell will be removed by the sodium calcium exchange. So that's sort of the homeostasis that occurs in the cells, um, the subtle differences in the atrial cells, but that's, uh, you know, it happens all the time, and all of these calcium fluxes are balanced. Uh, what can happen uh, uh, in the case of a uh, delayed after depolarization, and I'll show some of the experimental data, is that you can get uh, a spontaneous opening of these reanimate receptor channels during diastole when they should be closed, so you get this additional calcium leak 
the cell is trying to get rid of this calcium, so the sodium calcium exchanger is reactivated. It will get rid of the calcium, but in return, you get sodium that enters the cell. And as you all know, an action potential can actually start when there's enough sodium coming into the cell. That's how you can get these additional action potentials. Now, so if you have a lot more of these uh, BEDs and ectopic activity, one could theoretically uh, create uh, episodes of atrial fibrillation. Now, this concept of atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation is actually first described, I think, in 1995 when I was a medical student in, in the Maastricht, the Netherlands, and Maurice Celesi and Heinels and others worked on this. So the concept is that you have uh, short episodes of atrial fibrillation that induces remodeling, electrical remodeling of the atria, and that makes it easier for uh, atrial uh, fibrillation to run the system. Um, and this, although this concept has been known for about 20 years, I think there's still some key concepts that are unknown. For example, uh, a lot of the studies have focused in patients on uh, patients with chronic AF, but very little is known about the paroxysmal AF state. So I'd like to present some of our collaborative work with uh, dopamine and dobrev on the cellular mechanisms that can uh, cause uh, paroxysmal AF in uh, patients without extensive atrial remodeling. And then the question of remodeling, yeah, I think, is still quite elusive. But we don't really know what changes in the atria, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, during this transition phase. And we've used uh, uh, actually mouse models to, to gain some more insight into this. So I'll focus on uh, what happens primarily to calcium handling, remodeling in patients with paroxysmal AF. Um, and these studies were performed on. Uh, Atrial, right atrial appendage uh, uh, pieces obtained during cardiac surgery for coronary bypass surgery or mitral valve replacement. These are all patients uh, collected uh, in Germany and the tissues and cells are analyzed in Germany and, and in our lab. See a large number of patients. Uh, patients were either in sinus rhythm or had uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, and so about 70 years of age, uh, more males than females, and you know, a lot of them had uh, comorbidities and a lot of different drugs, but there were no major significant differences between the two groups other than atrial fibrillation, as you can see here. So one of the first things uh, that uh, a group did then was to uh, patch plant these atrial myocytes, you know, putting a pipette on the cell to measure the action potential. I was quite surprised to find that the action potential duration was similar in patients with paroxysmal AF compared to those in sinus rhythm. So there seemed to be an absence of uh, electrical remodeling in paroxysmal AF. We measure these action potentials at you know 20 percent, 50 percent, or uh, 90 percent repolarization. There were no significant differences, uh, and the amplitude of the action potentials were also the same. So that's probably not the cause why they have paroxysmal uh, AF. So the next step was to start looking at calcium handling. Um, as a matter of fact, <coughs> both the, uh, the L-type calcium current as well as the calcium release from the sarcoplastic reticulum were measured at the same time. And you can see that the, uh, the amplitude of the L-type calcium current was the same in sinus rhythm and paroxysmal AF. Uh, on the other hand, there was a slight increase in the amount of calcium that was released from the sarcoplastic reticulum through the reanimator receptors, and also the, uh, the reuptake of calcium, so the decay of the action, the, the calcium transient, was faster in paroxysmal AF compared to uh, sinus rhythm. So that's just quantified here on the right. <clears throat> so this already suggests that the SR calcium, sarcoplastic reticulum calcium handling is somehow affected uh, in these, uh, these patients. So in order to see if that could lead to abnormal calcium releases and, uh, and DEDs, the um, following experiment was done. Um, these are recordings, uh, both the, the calcium as well as the voltage in uh, isolated atrial myocytes that were challenged with very high calcium concentration. I think it's about five, uh, by, uh, millimolar, and then uh, they were paced at 0.5 hertz, and then we stopped pacing in a cell from uh, a normal patient in sinus rhythm, 
you rarely see spontaneous calcium releases. And this is really pushing the cell. If you do it on physiological calcium, you don't see anything. But here, in patients with paroxysmal AF, you see that they're much more prone to uh, showing uh, you know, calcium extra calcium transients or very large uh, uh, spontaneous calcium release events. And those often, about 80% of the time, also lead to uh, DADs, so changes in the membrane potential. And that was quantified here that um, you rarely see DADs in control cells, but you see them a lot more often in those patients with paroxysmal AF. So that may be one of the reasons why uh, you have uh, spontaneous episodes of AF. The question is, what is the underlying mechanism? What's wrong with the calcium handler? So one of the first things to do is how much calcium is actually stored in the sarcoplastic reticulum. And you can measure this by first uh, stabilizing the cell by pacing them at a steady rate and then quickly applying caffeine, which will cause the full release of all the calcium in the sarcoplastic reticulum. And you can see that the amplitude of the, the calcium dump is larger. So in other words, there's more calcium stored in the sarcoplastic reticulum. Uh, that's uh, shown here. So somehow these cells are holding more calcium. The question is, why is that? Do you have more calcium reuptake? Uh, so we looked at the expression levels of the circa enzyme that is the calcium pump, and surprisingly it was downregulated. You know, when you quantify it here, it's about a 40% downregulation. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's the opposite of what we were expecting. So then we looked at the inhibitor of this pump, uh, phospholamban, and its expression was unaltered, but it was a lot more phosphorylated. Now when this phospholamban is more phosphorylated, hyperphosphorylated, uh, you kind of turn off the inhibitor function. So when the inhibitor doesn't work, the circuit becomes more active. So um, these data suggest that because the inhibitor is more phosphorylated, you de-inhibit the remaining circuit and it becomes more active. And indeed, uh, the calcium reuptake function is accelerated, which I already showed you before, and uh, is here with kinetic analysis of uh, the the calcium uh, transients uh, quantified. So circuit's more active because phospholamin is hyperphosphorylated. Now does that, uh, so that's the, the reuptake part. What about the release? They have more or less release. Uh, we can measure that um, with a, uh, a calcium uh, leak protocol to quantify the amount of calcium that's released through the reanimate receptor uh, when the cell is not stimulated. So again, you, in steady state by pacing at 0.5 hertz, and then quickly you change the solution to zero sodium, zero calcium, so no calcium can go in and out of the cell, and then you add tetracaine that not only blocks the sodium channel, but also blocks the reanimate receptor. So any change in the baseline is the inverse of the amount of calcium that's leaking through the reanimate receptor. So we can quad uh, divide this amount of calcium leak by the total amount of calcium that's available in the sarcoplasm in particular. And then when you take the, the ratio here, you can see that uh, there's about a doubling of the amount of uh, calcium leak from the sarcoplasm in particular in patients with paroxysmal AF compared to the patients in sinus rhythm. So that seems to be counterintuitive. If more calcium leak, yet you have more calcium loading. On the other hand, if you have more calcium that's stored in the SR, then maybe, you know, that's why it's leaking more, because you just uh, have more uh, pressure, so to say, because the calcium is built up. Now the question is why are these reanimate receptors uh, leaking, or why is there more total leak? So you could have more channels, or you could have per channel, you know, more activity. So to see what happens per individual channel, we can do single channel recordings. So these reanimate receptors are deep inside the cell. You cannot put a patch like that on the cell. We have to isolate these uh, channels and then put them in an artificial lipid bilayer. And then you can record the single channel activity in a plain lipid bilayer. Uh, in the presence of a low amount of cytosolic calcium, uh, reanimate receptors you know, rarely open in uh, control patients. So every lip here is a channel opening. You can see in Patients with paroxysmal AF, um, you can see much more frequent uh, 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 channel openings and 
Uh, that's here the quantification of the individual data. And again, the average is about a five-fold increase in single channel activity. So somehow these channels are more active. Uh, in addition, <coughs> we wanted to quantify <coughs> the total number of rayonic receptors for breast and blotting. You can see here you have thicker bands and paroxysmal AF compared to sinus rhythm. There's about a three-fold increase in the expression level of the rayonic receptor compared to sinus rhythm. Now, I, did not, I won't have time to show you, but we've shown in several studies that patients with chronic AF that the rayonic receptor is more phosphorylated. That might be one of the reasons why these channels become more active. And we use um, antibodies that recognize the phosphor phosphorylated state of this rayonic receptor. We did not see any significant differences when we um, did this in eight different patients. So there's no increase in phosphorylation, um, only an increase in the total amount of channel. Um, so that was a little bit surprising because uh, you know, several studies have demonstrated that the hyperphosphorylation of the rayonic receptor is responsible for the uh, hyperactivity of the channel, which is not the case in, par in paroxysmal AF. So, so far, I think we've made a few uh, new observations in patients with paroxysmal AF. First of all, there's no electrical remodeling, at least in terms of the action potential duration. Of course, we did not measure all the, uh, the currents. Um, but there is pronounced calcium handling remodeling. Um, first of all, there's an enhanced propensity to spontaneous calcium release events, which you know, do correlate with trigger activity and irrefinite initiation, the more delayed after depolarizations. And that's probably because there's more loading of the sarcoplasmic reticulum due to enhanced calcium reuptake, which in turn could be caused by phospholambin hyperphosphorylation. And on the other hand, it also drives uh, rhiannon receptor mediated acid calcium leak, uh, which is caused by increased expression, but not by the increased phosphorylation. So that's different compared to uh, chronic data. So the question remained is, you know, when I showed you the single channel recordings, the rhiannon receptors were also more active. So even though you have more channels, every individual channel is more active. So why is that? And that was still, uh, unexplained at the time. Now, we had a, so you know, what's the molecular basis for this? And we had another study that was um, happening in the lab that maybe uh, will shed some light on this. So we've been interested in junctophilin. Um, it's more of a structural protein in the heart. And uh, it uh, was cloned in 2000 and was shown that it's sort of a, uh, connector between the plasma membrane and the T-tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And 2007, it was shown that inherited mutations in junctophilin can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in patients. Um, now, we looked at uh, the levels of junctophilin in patients with paroxysmal AF. Uh, this is another set of uh, samples. And what we found is, just like before, the rayonic receptor expression is increased by about threefold, uh, and the, but the level of junctophilin was unaltered, as you can see here on the total. But when you take the ratio, how many junctophilins per rayonic receptor is actually decreased. And uh, we think this may be relevant because junctophilin can negatively inhibit suppression. The I'm going to ask you a T tubule question. Yes, because in your previous slide, you clearly showed the T tubules again. And, and did you have a chance to compare the T tubules in the AFib and, uh, and the other people? Are they like detubulated, or is there any changes like that? Um, well, that's a good question. So, in the atrial myocytes, there are not that many T tubules at all, so we did not really focus on that. Uh, but we have generated mice in which we can acutely knock down junctophilin and then the T tubules go away or at least a lot of them disappear. Also when we look at development and we down regulate junctophilin, the T tubules um, don't interconnect and branch out as well as in the wild type mice. So I think there's a strong connection between the level of junctophilin and T tubules. But mostly in the ventricle. 
do you have an idea of who's in charge? In other words, is it the T2 fuels that limit the chunk of fill in or do you not have the chunk to fill in the T2? Well, based on our development paper, you know, we did down regulation and overexpression. Seems like uh, the level of junk to fill in drives the junk to fill formation. Um, but I think in the ATRA, the T2 was a less important. Uh, but we, what we found in this study, and I'll get to the, the punchline, is that junk to fill in binds to the reanidin receptor and that it actively regulates it. And when you don't have junk to fill in, reanidin receptors become more active. Actually, it's shown here. So we made mice in which uh, if you knock out junk to fill in, mice die. So it's a bad model. But we can uh, knock it down with shRNA. So we did a cardiac specific knockdown. So we get rid of about 80 to 90 percent of the junk to fill in. Mice survive. Uh, actually, we made an inducible one. So they, they survive till adulthood, and then you give them tamoxifen, get rid of junk to fill in, and then actually they die within a week or two. But during that time, you can harvest the hearts when junk to fill in is mostly gone. And then when we do single channel recordings in mice that are lacking junk to fill in, reanimate receptors are a lot more active. And when we add a peptide, uh, that corresponds to the domain of junk to fill in that binds to the reanimate receptor, we can completely reverse this. And uh, here, and then take the knockout mice and add the junk to fill in peptide. So junk to fill in actively regulates the reanimate receptor, and you can, uh, when you're lacking junk to fill in, the channels are hyperactive, and then you can fix that uh, with this peptide. So, so we were then were wondering, well, is the level of junk to fill in binding to reanimate, or just in general, the level of junk to fill in, does that correlate with the, the, the you know, inducibility of atrial fibrillation? So we had junk to fill in transgenic mice that had more junk to fill in in the heart, normal mice, wild type, and junk to fill in knockout mice that barely have any junk to fill in. These are the expression levels. And then we compared these mice, so we put a catheter in the mouse hearts that uh, programmed the electrical stimulation. Um, let's see. <coughs> Yeah, we found that uh, you know the non-transgenic mice occasionally have AF. When you look at the transgenic mice, it's less, but um, there's not an impressive uh, difference. But on the other hand, in the knockout mice, you know, the majority of the mice had inducible atrial fibrillation. And when you did the statistics, so it's really a sort of a dose-dependent uh, increase in atrial fibrillation. You know, when you started decreasing the levels of uh, junk to fill it. Now. That's uh, sort of the dose response. And uh, we, uh, our collaborators in Italy found this uh, family. And the program was actually a young kid, about three or four years old, who presented with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and paroxysmal AF. And the father also turned out to have Oakham and also supraventricular tachycardias. And they turned out to have a mutation in jump fillet. And this particular residue, the E169K, that's uh, in the domain that links the junk to fill in to the reanimate receptor. And um, we also identified other uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that did not have atrial fibrillation. And those are these other mutations that are shown. We uh, made uh, knock-in mice with this, this particular mutation as well as this other mutation that clinically does not correlate with <coughs> atrial fibrillation. And when we immunoprecipitated the reanimate receptors from hearts of those mice, and then looked at the amount of junk to fill in that was uh, binding to the channel, you can see that the non-transgenic mouse, the wild type transgenic, uh, or the, the, well, it's a transgenic cross with the knockouts, it's sort of a knock-in mouse of a wild type junk to fill in. This thing is not here. Uh, here's the E169, 169K mutation. You can see that junk to fill in can barely bind uh, to the reanimate receptor, and this is the other disease-causing mutation that does not affect the binding. So in other words, there's a very uh, mutation-specific reduction in the binding of mutant junk and film to the reanimate receptor. And what we then did is, again, EP studies on these mice, and we found atrial fibrillation in the E169K uh, mutant mice. You can see very fast atrial activity irregular QRS complexes on the surface EKG and you know, slower but irregular ventricular contractions. When we did the same induction protocol on this other mutation, we never saw AF. You can see that here. So uh, these are short episodes, uh, 
not spontaneously, but at least I think it proves the point that if junk and film, even though the total junk and film levels are the same as in the wild type mice, but when junk and film cannot bind to the reanimate receptor, these mice are more susceptible. So I think when you take everything together, uh, you know, it implicates that junk and regulates the reanimate receptor in the atria, and that's further proven here. When we isolated the atrial myocytes that directly uh, make this link. So atrial myocytes isolated from the wild type uh, mice, uh, E169K and this other mutation. And then we looked at the uh, amount of calcium sparks for the spontaneous calcium release events. And you can see that in the wild type cells, occasionally there's spontaneous calcium release, which is you know, what you would, would expect. But there's a lot more spontaneous calcium release events <coughs> in this uh, in the mice in which junctophilin cannot bind to the reanimate receptor. And that's not the case in this other mutation. So it's very mutation specific. You see more calcium sparks, and uh, we also, which is not shown here, you see calcium waves, but only in this particular mutant, not in the wild type or the other mutant. So what we think is that the reanimate receptor may be hyperactive, not because of changes in the phosphorylation, which happens in chronic air, but perhaps due to a relative uh, reduction in, uh, in the amount of junctifilin available for the increased number of reanimate receptors. You have a, a sarcoplasma reticulum that's more loaded because circus is more active. So you have a channel that's more likely to open, there's more calcium pushing from the inside and you get the spontaneous calcium release events that can set up uh, trigger activity and for a paroxysmal AF but the, because um, there's no electrical and structural remodeling yet the episodes probably uh, you know, self terminate pretty quickly um, then the question is what at some point starts driving the remodeling such that you know, maybe a year later these people do have chronic AF I think uh, that's a very important question that we uh, try to look at Actually, go on. Yeah. Uh, so, does chapter fill have anything to do with uh, with the phospholipid uh, uh, phospholipid? Um, we don't know. We did proteomics, and we did not see binding of circa the junk to fill it. But uh, since it's a, sort of a scaffolding protein, maybe it will bring. Findings of phosphatases nearby, we don't really know. So you don't have a clue why phospholipid is changing along with this uh, line of right. No, we don't really know. Uh, well, what, why the, the PKA phosphatation of phospholipid is up, but not the phosphatation of the reanimate receptor? We don't really know. I think uh, maybe it has to do with the local uh, you know, inhibitor or, or phosphatase activity that's suppressed or something along those lines. I mean, it does argue for very localized control of the phosphorylation. That's something we're interested in in general. Because in other states, uh, reanimate receptors are hyperphosphorylated and then phospholamine is unaltered. So I think the different disease states in which um, the phosphorylation of one but not the other one is affected. And I think we have to look at local kinase activity, local uh, phosphatase activity, and really sort this out. Uh, it's a very complicated issue. <laughs> All right, so, you know, in humans, uh, maybe you could study this if you have serial biopsies, but that seems to be a, an issue. Um, so I'm still looking for folks who uh, can biopsy the, <laughs> the atrium patients, but, uh, you know, so we really have to go to mice or, um, we can go to large animals too, of course, um, but it's harder to do genetic interventions. So we were lucky that one of our collaborators found this uh, mouse model that's a cyclic AMP response element, or CREM. And when you overexpress it in the heart, <coughs> these mice uh, show a sort of a human-like uh, progr progressive uh, development of atrial fibrillation. Here's the age of the mice. So at six weeks of age, they all have sinus rhythm. They spend most of the time in sinus rhythm. But then by, by about you know, two to three months of age, they start developing spontaneous atrial activity which over time uh, leads to more long-lasting episodes of atrial fibrillation that eventually become persistent. So, um, 
and I have to say, in the absence of a uh, profound ventricular phenotype, so they have a little bit of ventricular fibrosis, but uh, the EF and the, and the dimensions are pretty normal, even in the older mice. So uh, here is sort of a quantification in our own lab um, from this mouse model. So at three months of age, the normal sinus rhythm of wild type mice and the creme genetic mice start exhibiting these atrial ectopic beats. And I'll talk about the double mutant a little, a little bit. So they have spontaneous atrial active beat, but at three months of age, they never have uh, you know, spont uh, spontaneous atrial fibrillation. When you look at seven months of age, when these mice are older, then they do have uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, and that's quantified here on the bottom. So they still have uh, atrial ectopy, the transgenic mice, but they also have spontaneous atrial fibrillation. And at this age, uh, can last uh, 500 minutes, so that's hours at a time. When you look at five months in between, you know that uh, they also have atrial fibrillation, but only about half the mice. And the, the average duration of an episode is only about 30 minutes. So not only you know, between five and seven months, you get a lot, a lot more mice that have spontaneous EF, but also the episodes are tenfold or twentyfold longer. So they're, they're pretty much in AF uh, half the time or more. Um, now the question is, what happens to the molecular sort of uh, remodeling of calcium handling? So one of the things we've been interested in is uh, uh, the calcium chemodulin dependent kinase. There's a chronic AF that really seems to be one of the driving factors that alters calcium handling, and in particular, reanagram receptors and, and phospholamban. So we looked at the uh, amount of calcium chemology and kinase, and uh, that was not really uh, significantly altered in the, creme, the wild living creme mice over time. When we looked at the phosphorylation of camp kinase itself, uh, the autophosphorylation goes up and the enzyme is more active, you can see that you know, these bands getting darker and darker. So there's an increase over time, starting at three months early on, but then the seven months is even more pronounced. Comparing the white and the black bars, that gem uh, kinase becomes uh, autophosphorylated more active. And that also leads to an increased phosphorylation of the reanidin receptors. So uh, at a young age, uh, it's very minor, but it's, it's significant, but it's very modest increase in the chem kinase phosphorylation of the reanidin receptors at CRA in 2014, the main uh, phosphorylation site. And then by seven months of age, it's really a doubling of the phosphorylation. We also looked at phospholamban in these mice, and you know, the, the summary is there's no difference in uh, the phosphorylation of phospholamban. There's also a difference in PKA phosphorylation of the reanidin receptor, so it seems to be very specific to chemkinase phosphorylation. So, so perhaps uh, activation of chemkinase over time uh, you know, drives this uh, progression of atrial fibrillation. So the question is, can we block the leakage of calcium with a chemkinase blocker? Uh, and here's just how we measured it. We added a uh, Chem kinase inhibitor K93, and you know, compared to uh, cells from wild, atrial cells from wild type mice, you get about a doubling or two and a half fold increase in the SR calcium leak from the sarcoplastic reticulum, and that could be fully blocked with a chem kinase inhibitor. This leak is so bad that you even get a, a reduction in the SR calcium load. So the leak is not due to the increase in calcium loading, but uh, the reduction is probably a consequence of the leakage. Anyway, so we found that uh, chemokinase may be causally linked to the leak of calcium. Yes? Sorry. Um, is this just acute administration of the canine? Yes, it's just acute, uh, you know, uh, you throw it on the cells and then see what happens to the leak. Uh, so because of this, you know, um, we wanted to differentiate if the, uh, the effects of chemokinase were mediated by the reality receptor or not. <coughs> So we could do this because we had a knock-in mouse in which we had mutated the serine phosphorylation site uh, that's target of chem kinase on the reanimate receptor to an alanine. So these mice, uh, in these mice, we made it impossible for chem kinase to phosphorylate the reanimate receptor. And then we crossed those to the crime mice. 
And we, you know, we looked at the calcium sparks, which are a mes measure of spontaneous calcium leakage. So I'll guide you through the figure, but it's wild type mice, you know, more than the doubling spark frequency in the creme mice. When you add K93, the chem kinase blocker, you can block it. When you add the uh, K92, which is similar chemical, but it, it's a negative uh, control that it, it does not block chem kinase, it doesn't work. And then uh, use another chem kinase blocker, AIP, it also works. And then we looked at our creme double muted mice. So if we only mutate the chem kinase phosphorylation site on the reanimate receptor, we can block the increase in calcium sparks, suggesting that the main downstream target of chem kinase is indeed the reanimate receptor. So we also looked at the single channels from those mice, creme transgenic mice have, have more active reanimate receptors, and that could be reversed by only blocking one amino acid, the chem kinase site, uh, at least, you know, significantly suppressed. So then the question was, well, does that do anything to atrial ectopy and or the uh, progression of atrial fibrillation? So I have to go back because, uh, you know, we actually did that uh, from the very beginning. So when you look at this young mice, at three months of age, you can see that the double mutant is the creme crossed with the, the S2014A mutation in the reanimate receptor. So by blocking the reanimate receptor, we can suppress atrial activity, and that's sort of what we expected, right? Because um, the calcium release is required for ectopic activity. But then later on, if you look at the older mice, it's very interesting, they still have uh, atrial activity. So even though we fix the reanimate receptor, they still somehow have more ectopic activity. And even though they have the same level of ectopic activity, only the crown mice develop spontaneous EF, and there's you know, no, but never ever saw spontaneous EF in these double mutant mice. Have you looked at uh, what exactly is anatomic location of those ectopic beads? Um, yeah, that's a little bit harder than the mouse. We, I'll get to the optical mapping in a second, but uh, we don't really know if it's on the pulmonary vein or from somewhere else. That's so, so the optical, oh, let's see optical. Yeah. So I think you know, there's a dissociation now between ectopic activity, which is not rescued, and then on the other hand, you know, we find it very interesting that these mice, the double mutant mice, never develop spontaneous AF. So, so one is a sort of substrate for the induction of AF, even if they don't have spontaneous AF. Uh, so we looked at that with the uh, overdrive pacing studies with the catheters in the, in the mouse hearts, wild type prime mice and the double mutant mice. So if we took a five-month-old creme mouse uh, that had some atrial activity but no spontaneous AF, and then we did overdrive pacing of the atrial stop, we could often induce atrial fibrillation. And the double mutant mice, we were never able, never able to induce atrial fibrillation, as shown here. So it seems like there's just not a substrate for AF in those mice. So why is that? So that's why we went to optical mapping. Uh, so we cut off the atria and then uh, actually the calcium and voltage mapping, but I'm only showing the, the voltage here. Um, first of all, you can see that the atria are larger, you know, cover more area than the wild type mice. And uh, uh, we looked at cram mice that were in sinus rhythm and cram mice in spontaneous AF. Here you see like areas that are not even electrically uh, active, uh, so they're really in bad shape. But, Clearly, you can see uh, abnormal, you know, conduction here in the creme mouse, even though they're in sinus rhythm. Compared to the wild type mouse, we can see very nice isochrones. In the double congenic mice, you can see it's almost a full restoration of the, the activation uh, uh, maps. Now we look at the actual potential duration in those uh, isolated parts. You can see that the creme mice have longer action potentials. Uh, there's no difference in the crown mice that were in sinus rhythm or in uh, atrial fibrillation prior to the ex excision of the heart. And this was not uh, rescued in the double uh, muted mice, so they still have these longer action potentials. So in other words, this part of the phenotype is not affected by mutating the reanimate receptor, preventing this calcium leak. You still have electrical remodeling. We also looked at the conduction velocity, and it was uh, reduced in the cram mice, but this parameter was actually uh, restored 
by mutating the reanimal receptor. Um, now, why is that? Well, one of the main reasons, I think, why conduction velocity might be affected is remodeling of connections. And uh, you can see here that um, when we look at the connection 40 levels, there's a reduction uh, in the paramtrogenic mice and uh, restoration in the double mutant mice that's shown here. So that may be one of the reasons. I know it's a lot more complex, but uh, cram transgenic mice lose connections, and we can prevent this loss of connections in the double mutant mice. Uh, so then we looked at atrial size, because as you know, dilation of atria is a major risk factor for AF. You see that the atrial weight is uh, about doubled in the cram transgenic mice, and that was fully uh, uh, restored in the cram. Uh, S2014A mice. So probably the, the dilation and the expansion of the atria may be a calcium uh, driven process. Now the two major pathways involved in cardiac uh, growth and hypertrophy, NFAT, um, so the calcineurin NFAT pathway or the uh, chem kinase uh, MEF2 HDAC pathway. So we looked at both, uh, you know, with the initial assays. You can measure ARCAN uh, activity, which is a measure of NFAT activity. You see it's uh, activated in the cram mice, and we can prevent this in the double mutant mice. So that suggests that the activation of calcineurin and NFAT may be uh, caused by calcium leak for reanimate receptors. Well, if that's the case, if we make this channel more leaky, then it should activate the pathway. And that's what we did in this uh, mutation in the reanimate receptor. So these are mice and which shows an activating mutation of the chem kinesite. Single channel activity is more active, and that was sufficient to induce uh, activation of NFAT. Uh, so we think we've shown it both ways. We can protect the activation, or we can induce it uh, you know, with the gain of function. When we looked at the, uh, uh, the, the transcription of uh, MAF2C, there's no difference. So there's a clear separation. One pathway is activated, the other one is not. Why is the right atria affected, but more than the left? Um, in the crime line? On this example? Yeah, I don't really know. I, I think uh, it may just be the way it's uh, it's shown here. I think both atria are bigger. And I don't think we noticed a major difference between the left and the right. I agree, it looks like it. But this one is also enlarged. Um, okay, so then. We also wanted to know fibrosis, so that may contribute to the, you know, they may design a structural remodeling. So we did uh, mason trichrome staining, and we found that the creme mice had more fibrosis in the atria, and that was not uh, reduced in the double mutant mice. So the fibrosis is probably not driven by the calcium leak. And on the other hand, we also found that the S2014D mice, which is calcium leak, that was not sufficient to cause fibrosis. So I thought it was quite interesting that even though these mice still have a lot of fibrosis in the atria, they never develop atrial fibrillation. You know, a lot of people spend time quantifying fibrosis and you know, with MRI and different methods in, in patients with AF, and they think they can correlate it to maybe AF progression. Well, I know, I know this is only a mouse, but uh, you know, this would kind of challenge that uh, the importance of the fibrosis uh, per se. Um, uh, when you have the stop mutation, did you check the other phosphorylation of the camp kinase? Uh, is that changed by, or is it still remains like the uh, Actually, let me see. That should be here. So camp kinase is still active yeah. in the double mutant mice. But the, the phosphorylation of the reanimate receptor, of course, because we genetically mutated, it's gone. So yeah, so the camp kinase is still activated by the cram, but we kind of block it at a downstream level. Now, let me see, coming to the end, the question, the reviewers ask, oh, well, that's really nice, but is it even important for patients? So. Can, can I ask a question about yeah. the, the fibrosis and the also the atrial size? Did you look at that in five and seven months like you looked at some of the other days? Is this a progression? Is this something that's going on? Uh, uh, yes, it's progressively getting, getting, getting bigger. larger over time and getting more fiber out over time. Yes. Um, I think this, this is about seven months when things are you know, pretty bad in the cram mice. So we wanted to know if, first of all, if this 
uh, FRAP is also active in patients. So we look at patients with paroxysmal AF and chronic AF, and we found that this particular transcription factor is indeed upregulated. So a transgenic model of this factor is you know, probably at least mimicking this aspect of uh, remodeling in the patients. We also looked at the downstream uh, pathways, <clears throat> and we found that uh, this RCAN uh, or n activity is increased at both in paroxysmal and chronic AF, but that the MEF2 pathway was not activated. So it nicely correlates to our transgenic uh, mice. <clears throat> so I think uh, what we think uh, may happen is you know, early on in paroxysmal AF, the reanimate receptor is not hyperphosphorylated, but you, you can have spontaneous calcium releases. At some point, can kinase becomes activated. We can speculate why. Uh, it can increase the phosphorylation of the reanimate receptor, which makes it more leaky. So you get more diastolic calcium release. And this calcium leak can activate uh, calcium dependent uh, signaling, such as uh, calcium urine and fat signaling. Somehow, we don't know how, but it can downregulate connections and slow the conduction. And I'm sure all the pathways are involved too that are calcium dependent. And you know, all of this together probably creates a more vulnerable substrate for atrial fibrillation. <coughs> At least and this, this is calcium dependent. There may be other um, consequences that are independent of the SO calcium leak. But together, this may be sufficient or at least an important contributor to AF progression. We think this is relevant because uh, there are blockers now for chemkinase um, that you know, uh, startup companies as well as I know some big pharma are working on. Um, also the inhibitors for reanimate receptor leak. Uh, you know, I've worked on this with Andy Marks and now there's different classes of blockers of these uh, channels with uh, some of them are clinical trials and heart failure patients, and some are in preclinical development. So that may be a, a new way to, uh, to start treating AF very early on. Uh, now, I'll stop here, because I'll probably use up the time. I want to thank folks in my lab, especially uh, Nali is now uh, independent at Yale, who's done a lot of this work. I have a lot of collaborations with various people, especially uh, Dobomir Dobrev, who uh, has done all the uh, calcium measurements in the human cells, and more recently we've worked with Stan Attell, and these are the guys who have created the, the cram mice, and these are the people who found the junk to fill mutation. So a lot of this work requires extensive collaborations, and uh, very grateful for all their contributions. So that's a new Baylor hospital. <laughs> you, say you guys want to visit Houston? This is the math center, it's the whole city, and then Baylor recently built their own hospital uh, next to the VA, and, it's uh, where I wanted to end. So thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Clinically, I used to believe that patients who had paroxysmal and transfer to a uh, permanent AF did it as a result of kind of a, a gradual increase of burden and more and more AF until they became you know, sustained permanently. There's been some recent data, however, uh, there's uh, a group that looked at reporting pace papers and patients, and what they found is, is basically the transition was quite sudden, and what, what they saw was, is patients who were in PAF, actually most patients when they transfer to, transferred to permanent AF, or persistent AF as first, that they actually were in normal sinus rhythm for days in advance. So. It, it seems that this whole idea that there's a kind of a continuous remodeling due to the atrial fibrillation is not really what's going on, but rather there's some other underlying mechanism. And I was just wondering how you think that data fits in, and what is it that triggers it to kind of go over the line mm -hmm. that, you know, there, there's almost no change in burden. In fact, in this group of patients they looked at, the patients with low NAF in particular, their burden actually kind of went down over time, I guess, probably because they were being treated with lots of different drugs that did that. But there was obviously some underlying process. And the patients who had associated coronary diseases, cardiovascular diseases like mitral valve disease and, 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 and you know, coronary disease and things like that, their burden did increase slightly, but not much. It was almost all, all the patients, when they went, when they transitioned from PAF to persistent AF, 
it was a sudden event that was, was there was no warning really that you would expect. Well, you know, I think those are very important observations uh, and that are often difficult to you know, to translate to correlate with uh, some of the more mechanistic findings. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's possible that there is subclinical remodeling in those patients, and you know, when you hit a certain threshold of, say, if these pathways are important, if you hit a certain threshold, then you're more likely to, to go into AF. It's a possibility. Uh, you know, maybe there's a sudden change in innovation of the atria or stretch that can further exacerbate, uh, you know, subclinical remodeling. I think we, we don't really know, right? Um, so this chem kinase you know, may be important because it's regulated not just by the rate. So I think that's maybe a mechanism why when you have AF, you can keep this enzyme active as a driver of remodeling or ectopic activity. <clears throat> but it's also a sense of oxidative stress, of changes in, in glucose. So it's sort of a cellular sensor that can be activated quite suddenly if something were to change, ischemia, uh, dysregulation of glucose metabolism. I mean, these are all speculations. Yeah, I'm just curious. You know, awesome. I think there's only one way to find out is to, <clears throat> to go to patients and do these measurements, and I talked with Igor before. So you know, we might follow calcium over time in patients. Did that show a gradual increase in the burden of, of, a, of PAF before it became continuous, or, or was it a you know was it a sudden or, you know, like gradual? Uh, and individual mice. Yeah. Uh, I think it sort of slowly progressed. I think, but I, I cannot tell you. I don't remember mice. You know, if there was some mice that out of the blue had AF or <clears throat> if they have more and more ectopy and then transition. We never really <clears throat> looked at it, you know, at a single animal level. So maybe worth doing that. We still have the data. Thank you. Do you look to see the uh, whether chemokinase was auto phosphorylated uh, in an increased way in the proxies of patients? Um <clears throat> Yes, I think we did, and I think it was not not effective, if I remember correctly. But in the chronic, it definitely is. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, in all your experiments, I understand were done, or correct me if, if I don't understand, were done without sympathetic stimulation. Right. So, uh, <clears throat> remember during our meeting today, I mentioned that we looked at ventricular activity in failing human heart sources in failing, and we saw really dramatic difference when you actually apply sympathetic stimulation. And I mean, more specifically, there is a distinction between beta-1 and beta-2 stimulation. So have you done any adrenergic uh, stimulation? Or, so what, what would be your expectation if you consider this factor? How much more, what would be exaggerated difference, let's say with junk to feeling, for example, in the house? Um, we have, <coughs> we have not considered that factor, so uh, so I don't know what the result is, but I think uh, we could look in young crime mice and see if you stress yeah, the crime mice also. Yeah, right? do beta one and beta two activation, or, you know, so that would exacerbate the phenotype. That could be quite interesting. Um, we just look, <coughs> look at you know, sort of more the, the monogenetic types of AF. You know, they typically don't have spontaneous AF. But when you do the pacing studies, you can provoke it. And uh, in those cases, often the acute beta adrenergic stimulation doesn't really help. Uh, but I realize it's very different than uh, a mouse with a remodeled substrate, uh, which may be more clinically relevant. So I think that's a good suggestion. Uh, we, we can try it. And also, can we look at connecting 43? You, you, you look only at 40, I know. We look mainly at 40, because I think that's mostly expressed in the atria, right? I don't no, know, the 43 and 40 are both expressed. And I don't know if you've seen a couple of papers on aging, in annual models, aging and association of atrial fibrillation mm -hmm. was shown that P38 pathway uh, affects connexin 43 down regulation, but not connexin 40. So these are differentially regulated due to stress 
Um, my pain is signaling, so I was wondering if you first of all looked at my pain is signaling, probably not. Maybe good, good suggestion. No, yeah, but we, <coughs> we, we plan on using this mice uh, mm -hmm. for quite a few more experiments. But also look at the distinction between connection 43 and connection 40, because they're clearly very differently regulated. I'm pretty sure we looked at that, I just don't know if it was altered or not. Um, we decided only to report the 40 because that's, I guess, thought to be more atrial specific. Yeah. No, it is specific, but like but they, yeah, it does not expose the other ones on the atrial too, so I agree we need to do more detailed characterization. There's only that much you can do with the mouse atrium, right? So <laughs> <laughs> we have all, the, all these blocks, and, uh, but we have more mice now, so. I was going to ask you about the embryology of the atrium. In, 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 in humans, as I recall, the area of the pulmonary veins in that area is not from the heart too. It's another part of the tissue, or embryologically. And so that suggests that um, depending on where you, at least in human age, I don't know if it's true or mice, that's my question, mm -hmm. which is if their embryology is the same and a piece of their atrium comes from, not from the cardiac too, it suggests that it may matter where you get your sample from when you do isolated cell experiments. And that's my question, which is, have you looked at different pieces of the atrium? Do the pulmonary vein regions behave differently than other regions? Uh, <clears throat> this is a good question. I, I believe that also in mice, uh, you know, the pulmonary vein areas are derived from a very distinct population during development. Uh, I wouldn't be able to name it, but uh, I've discussed it a few times with colleagues. Uh, you know, what we're hoping to do is at some point to maybe cut this atria open and look at the pulmonary veins <coughs> of optical mapping to see you know, if you have a lot more activity in those areas. We're just looking at such a tiny tissues and, you know, if you like slice it open and might damage it. So we've been reluctant to do that for the first study, but uh, I know we have to go there at some point. Um, so I think... Because, I mean, you know, in the maze procedure, in, in humans, they try to isolate the pulmonary vein yeah. because they believe that, that that's one of them. Well, ablations too, right? So yeah. A lot of people try to do this. But I think there's a lot of discussion if that's the best approach or not. So, uh, our goal is to put the ablation people out of business. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your attention.